And archetype is a ill-defined term. And that's, that's partly why it's very difficult to understand you. It's also very difficult to transform the sorts of things that he had to say into very precise scientific formulations. But, but it, that doesn't change the fact that it's extraordinarily useful from the perspective of general understanding, which is a useful thing to pursue, and also from the perspective of practical utility, to understand something about these archetypal categories. And the reason for that is, you're in their grip. Now, one of the things that Jung said, this is a brilliant thing, it's terrifying. Psychoanalysts are terrifying people. Freud's bad enough, you know, because <laughs> Freud dug around in the pathology of the family. And, like, families can be great, but if you want real pathology, a family is a good place to look. So, because a pathological family is so pathological that it's unbelievable. And that's actually what Freud was interested in. And it, it's, 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 again, it's hard for normal, sort of healthy people to appreciate that, because if you're normal and healthy and your family's kind of, you know, not half bad, you don't have all those Freudian problems. But if you do have them, that's all you have. You never get out of it. You're trapped in there like a, like a fly in a spider's web. And in fact, the fly in a spider's web is a common symbolic representation of the classic Freudian situation. So, um, okay, so, I'm going to, I showed you this picture because I want to talk to you about a category system that will be useful in understanding what we're going to go through during this course. So what I would like to do with all of you is to start from the bottom of things, and that's what we were doing today when we are talking about <coughs> definitions of truth. So I, I asked you to consider for a moment that there's two ways of looking at truth. One is your objective sort of Newtonian way, which by the way is outdated. We still hold it because it's practically useful. And the other is the Darwinian perspective, which is the world is meaningful in relationship to you. And those meanings are real insofar, insofar as they have a bearing on whether or not you actually survive. So, and, and, and then you make the claim that there isn't anything more real than whether or not you survive. You can't get under that. That's where you start. So, so you could say, I could say, for example, if the pursuit of the Newtonian theory of reality culminated in the extinction of human beings, say, because our technological power got so great, that would be perfect evidence for its lack of truth, because there are things it just wasn't taking into account. Right? Because something that's true should take things into account. And one of the things it should take into account is that we're living things, that we can only exist under certain, you know, within certain parameters, and that we're also oriented towards an ideal. And if your theory doesn't take that into account, well, maybe not only is it incomplete, it might be pathologically and, and, and genocidally incomplete. All right. This is a representation from ancient Egypt. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the representations mean. So, this person here is Horus, and this person here is Osiris, and that person there is Isis. And Osiris is the god of tradition, and that's why he's sort of standing there on that pillar. And so, the Egyptians thought of these three, there's one other, there's Seth, and Seth is a bad guy. So, Seth is the evil villain that's always whispering in the king's ear. You see that story repeated in all sorts of different forms. So Seth is, is a negative figure, and he's not included in these particular images, but we'll, we'll get to him. Seth is also, by the way, Osiris's brother. So, and that's because the Egyptians had figured out, and this is like 3,000 years BC, the Egyptians had already figured out that if you put a state together, so the state would be represented by Osiris, and Osiris is sort of like the abstraction of the patriarchal force that stands behind a tradition. So, if you imagine that a tradition is a way of behaving, because that's what a tradition is, to the degree that you share a tradition, you're all manifesting the same pattern. And the Egyptians would say, the pattern that you're imitating, that's a deity. That's, I mean, they, they didn't think of it that way, because they didn't think the way we think. But for all intents and purposes, the phenomena that they described as a god was the pattern that everyone was unconsciously imitating. Now, you have to unconsciously imitate the same pattern, or you can't get along, right? So, in, in, in our society, for example, we have a body of laws, and it, most of it's derived from English common law. 
and English common law emerged as a consequence of the necessity to solve disputes between people so that all hell didn't break loose. So English common law was produced when one person took another person to court to say, we've got a serious problem. We don't know how to organize our behavior in the same space. You have to make a ruling. And so then the judge would assess the situation and state who had the right to do what. And then that became part of the law. Now, insofar as you are law-abiding citizens, and so you abide by the body of law, you actually manifest the body of law in your behavior. And to the degree that you do that, other people like you. To the degree that you don't do that, you're either poorly trained, poorly socialized, antisocial, or, or downright dangerous, in which case other people will put you somewhere where you're of less harm than you might be. So, like it or not, you're a mimicker. And what you mimic is the central pattern of cultural behavior that has evolved over who knows how long. Forever. Forever. Insofar as some of it's associated, say, with dominance hierarchy behavior, which is unbelievably old. That's Osiris. That's Osiris. That's God the Father, so to speak. And it's part of the, it's part of the category of culture. Now, the Egyptians also knew that culture was not only necessarily a good thing, as of course all of you know, because no doubt sometimes you know that you're the beneficiary of your culture, but sometimes no doubt you also feel that you're like crushed and, and mistreated and molded and bent out of shape by the culture, because the culture says, you better act like everybody else expects you to. And of course that's necessary, but you're not exactly like everybody else, so you kind of get mangled and crunched and you know, malformed as you're socialized, even though you also learn to speak and you learn to read and you learn all those things that culture can provide with you. Now, the Egyptians knew even 3,000 years ago that although culture was necessary, it was a, an element of existence that human beings were always embedded in. That, that's why it's a permanent category. There's no non-cultural people. You can't be a human being without a culture. It's, it's not possible. We're, we're evolved. Our, our physiological form presumes that we're going to emerge into the world in a culture. And that will inform us as we develop. That's why we have such a long developmental period. Right? We're, we're born unformed. And the only reason that works is because the, the, uh, the lack of form has been consistently manifested in an environment that would form it. So culture isn't just culture, it's the environment that we inhabit because culture has been around for so long.